It is, like I said, an awesome day. I do have some things to say this morning, and I, I, uh, I don't know in my own self, because we're talking about now, we're talking about the mind, how it's all going to come together. But I know on the inward man, there's, there's a plan. Yes, thank you. Glory to God. Stepping out and stepping into that place. That there's a, there's a definitive place for you to walk. Not a place of possibilities, but a place of definitions. Definitive. Definitive that God has planned for you. And those, those places that God calls us to has an end has an end, not terminal, but as we walk and develop and grow and are faithful, and I like this, as we humble ourselves in the mighty hand of God, God then begins to exalt us in his kingdom, not exalt us pridefully, but we develop, we grow, we learn, and we move forward. So there is a definitive place for you to step into. Definitive that's been predestined, destinated, predestinated by the hand of God before you were even born. The issue is, do we step into that fullness of it or do we dance around it through our disobedience? We've all heard this, obedience is better than sacrifice. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 19 says, If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good, the fat of the lamb. There's a place in the realm of the Spirit of God for you to walk that's powerful, authoritative. We're not talking about predestined to what your work or career is. We're talking about predestined to walk in the authority of the power of the Lamb of God through the blood that Jesus sanctified you in. There's a place for you to walk in the realm of God that he wants to take you beyond natural reasoning, per se, and understanding and help develop you spiritually that will bring authority and understanding, that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened, that you may know the hope of your calling, the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness to him who believes according to the working of his mighty power that's at work within you. That same mighty power that went down into hell and jerked Jesus back to life, from spiritual death unto life. This morning I was pondering what I would be. I always have my, my study, but I want to share some things with you that's happened over this week because I think it's very important that we understand how important it is when God calls us to pray, to pray. And there is a call to prayer that many do not heed in this day and this hour. They walk on thinking somebody else will do it, somebody else will take care of it, somebody else. But that somebody else could be you. And the life that hangs in the balance could be yours. This week, well, let me, let me start out with this scriptures, and then we'll, I'll share these stories with you. In Genesis chapter 18, I'll begin reading in verse 16. We see the story of Jesus coming to Abraham. And Jesus is coming to Abraham to tell him of what he's going to do. And what he's going to do is he's going to bring judgment ac across Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's going to destroy it because of the rampant perverseness and sin that's going on as a sign of what's to come. So in verse 16 says, Then the men got up and, and rose up from 
thence and looked out towards Sodom, and they left. And Abraham went, to, went with them to send them, excuse me, on their way. Verse 17 says, should I hide my plan from Abraham? Now understand that Abraham is in covenant with God. They're covenant partners. When we talk about the covenant between Abraham and Jesus or Abraham and God, when we talk about the blood covenant, you have to remember it's almost as such as the covenant that we have in marriage almost as represents or identifies to that same type of covenant. There's not, in my marriage, trust me, there's not nothing I'm going to hide from Kim. There's a few things I like to hide from Kim, Pastor Kim, but there's nothing I know better. Why? Because I don't want the wrath. <laughs> and so, there's nothing in our marriage that's hidden. It's all open. And now, God's coming to Abraham as a covenant partner, and he's fixing to do something. He's fixing to bring judgment across the land. And what's he say? Should I hide from my covenant partner what I'm about to do? For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation. He didn't say a great and mighty man. A great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by, by doing what is right and just. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. And so as we continue to read on, we see verse 20. So the Lord told Abraham, I've heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah, and because their sin is so flagrant. Notice that. Because their sin is so flagrant. It's right out there. They don't care. It's in your face. Sin is in our face every day now. It's flagrant. What used to be taboo to talk about is not just not taboo, but it's now on TV. It's promoted as a lifestyle. It's applauded. And anybody who disagrees with that has some sort of tagline added to their last name. If we disagree this well that's so the Lord said, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because they're sin. Notice that the, that Sodom the city is crying because of the flagrantness of the sin. I'm going down there to see if their actions are as wicked as I've heard. If not, I want to know. The other men turned and headed towards Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. And Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked because the wicked flagrant Violent sin. Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Now understand what's about to happen is judgment is coming to Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because they're flagrant sin. What is sin? Sin is just basically direct rebellion to the laws, the principles of God. Why would you be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same? Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Isn't that interesting that Abraham is now reminding the Lord? He's, I mean, none of us would talk to the Lord like that, right? But we have the right word, covenant. I have a right as a covenant partner to, to beseech the Lord on the behalf of the righteous as well. And the Lord replied, if I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the entire city for their sake. Notice that if I find 50 righteous people, if I can find 50, I'm going to spare the city. Then Abraham spoke in, since I've begun, let me speak further to my Lord, even though I am but dust and ashes. Suppose there are only 45 righteous people rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy if I find it 
45 righteous people there. Then Abraham pressed his request further. Suppose, I want you to see something about Abraham. He was not only in a covenant relationship, but he was in a relationship and comfortable enough with the relationship that he was able to speak to the Lord in such a manner. You know, every, there are times where Kim and I may be communicating and it may sound like, you know, wow, they must not love each other. But we are just being real with each other. Abraham is being real with God. He's calling. He knows what's going to happen because God's already told him what's going to happen. And so what's he doing now? He's interceding on their behalf. Then Abraham pressed his request further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy for the sake of 40. Verse 30, please don't be angry, my Lord. Abraham pleaded, let me speak. Suppose only 30 righteous people are found. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it if I find 30. Then Abraham said, since I have dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there are only 20. The Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. Finally, Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me. If I speak one more time, suppose only 10 are found there. And the Lord said, then I will not destroy it for the sake of the ten. The Lord will pres per preserve for the righteous. And the Lord replied, and when the Lord had finished his conversation with Abraham, he went on his way and Abraham returned to his tent. And the Lord continued to deal with the dip as, okay, so that's something else. So he went on to, on to his tent. And we know the story that they couldn't find ten. In fact, the only righteous man that was really left was Lot. And Lot was on the fence because he'd been in the society of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah got down the inside of him. Yep. But God still preserved him because he was of the righteous seed. There's judgment coming to the land. We could go many directions, but I, I got to say what I got to say this morning. Let me share this with you because it's important that we understand the realm of the spirit is more real than the realm that we're sitting here. This past week, we all, we've all know that John Michael had surgery, right? Many of you have seen the pictures and, and what happened. But there's another side of the whole story. I'm going to tell you a side of the story that you don't know because I want you to see, I read this, because we see Abraham interceding for the judgment of God. We see Abraham interceding for people's lives. We see that as people, as, as he interceded, God said, I will do what I will do if there is righteous people there. I will not do it, right? I shared that story because I want you to see this part of the story. Prayer works. There are times when God calls us to pray. You may not know what that prayer is. You may not know what you're praying for, but you have that unction. You have that on the inside of you. You can't get away from it. And so if we're not careful, we'll push that down and walk away from it. And as I said in the beginning, then lives hang in the balance. So on Monday, John Michael had his surgery. Seven and a half hours. It took them to do the work. And, you know, when you come out of surgery, the doctors are all, whoo, yeah, everything's good, he's fine. But you can't foresee the future. God knows the future, but you can't foresee the future. That's why it's important. And I go back to when John Michael, before he was born. I've told you the story. We were led to pray a whole different way than what, you know, we were praying for his nervous system. We were praying that he would live and not die. We were declaring these things, right? And so when he was born, and the complications that he was born dead, we were able, because we spoke the word of God, God was able to come in and do what he do because we did what we did. 
Sometimes, I think it was Howard Carter that said that God can do nothing in the earth except through prayer goes before it. It's important to understand that we are in partnership with God. We just think that God comes down and just does what he does. And he doesn't have control of the earth like we think he does. The earth has been leased out to the God of this world, it says in Corinthians, Satan. Because Adam gave that authority to Satan. So God is like a landlord. He's the landlord of the earth. Now, I being a landlord, you know, I have certain rules and laws that I have to follow when I'm dealing with tenants. I just can't walk into their home at any time because it's my home and do what I want in the house. It's my home, but they have, they have rights. And really, tenant rights almost outweigh landlord rights. And the same is true in the spiritual realm. The earth is leased out right now. So God can't just come and do whatever he wants. I can't go into that house and do whatever. Well, I think I'm going to go have dinner. I'm going to go see what they have in the refrigerator. I can't do that. It's against the law. I can't go in the house without giving them a 48-hour notice. I can't be on property without giving proper notice. Now, they can ask me to come. I need, my, I need the stove fixed. I need the air conditioning. Well, they've sent a request. Then we get on it. And we're doing the same thing with God. We're sending that request. We're getting him involved. And so, when John Michael came out of surgery, it wasn't as, woohoo, he made it as wonderful. I mean, he was an it was immense trauma to his body. And so to help alleviate the trauma, they put him on some very heavy-duty narcotics, which suppressed a lot of his natural, his breathing, his heart rate, his things of that nature. Now, Kim stayed with him at night, and then I stayed with him during the day. And so on Tuesday, uh, I had to go take care of my chores out on, with the horses, and Kim was there a little later than normal. And so this is the first day after surgery. And sometime during that day, he quit breathing in the morning. And his other natural heartbeat and everything began to decrease and we would say on, on this side of it, it was touch and go. Kim had to keep reminding him, waking him up to breathe and there were times they couldn't get him awake and, and so you know for two days he was, he was just gone. And so over the weekend, now John Michael's home. I'm telling you the story because I want you to see how important it is to pray when, you're, when you have that unction. So John Michael uh, had, an, had an experience. Now, uh, Pastor Sandy was over last night with Mark Edward, and we were talking to him. And every day we get just a little more, he's a little more comfortable in releasing more information. But sometime during Tuesday morning, he stepped out of his body. And he was floating above the room. And there was a great cloud of witnesses that were beckoning him to come. He saw Inez. She was just smiling as big as could be at him. My parents were talking to him. He met his grandfather who passed away in 1988. He never met. And he said, I, I met this guy. He was kind of bald-headed. I didn't know who he was, but he was talking to me. He says, we got a lot to catch up on. And as he described him, I thought, well, I know who that is. So I went and got a picture He'd never really seen his grandfather. I said, is this the man you saw? He said, yeah, that's him. 
that's him. You see, Tuesday, all day, Pastor Sandy tells us, I can't get away from it. I'm praying. I don't, I don't know what I'm praying about. I'm praying. Now, John Michael, he had told us before he, didn't, he wasn't ready to die. He's not ready to die today. And so he declined the offer. But he described the room. He described the people in the room. He described what was going on. He described people on the other side. He had a decision. He chose to stay. The next day, Jesus appeared to him. He just waved at him. Hey, angels in the room. These are experiences that we take so lightly but it is a definitive time in the earth. And there's coming more angelic visitations. There's coming more of the glory of God. But I shared that with you this morning because of the importance it is for us when we are stirred to pray, to pray. Like this morning, we were stirred to pray. We pray. Don't know why. We pray. Now, for the last several nights, Pastor Kim has had to stay in John Michael's room because that alarmed him. He thought those people were coming back for him. He didn't understand that they, they can't come and get him. It's not like Body Snatchers 2.0. <laughs> those were family members on the other side beckoning him that if he wanted to come, he could come. Our family is waiting for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those that have gone before us, the cloud of witnesses, are there. So, just like with Abraham interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah, interceding means standing in the gap. There are times that you will be called by the Spirit of God to stand in the gap that you cannot take that lightly. Many of us have myself included, gotten too busy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll pray, I'll pray, I'll pray, I'll pray. Thank God for people who stood up. And I know that Pastor Sandy wasn't the only one. People were pinging us. We're praying, man. We don't know what's going on, but we're praying. And in that time, you have to relinquish and rest in God. Yeah. Pastor Kim, before the surgery, pressed in and pressed in and pressed in and pressed in and she got a word from God that it was going, he would live and not die and it was going to be okay. It didn't say anything. He's going to go through all this stuff to get there though. I want to share with you because we're talking about the spiritual. We're talking about opening the, you know, into the realm of God, into the realm of the spirit. Is it possible to see beyond the natural realm? Yes. Within the 12 gifts of the Spirit, we have the, um, the gift of, um, no, seeing into the realm of the Spirit, discerning of spirits, thank you. So I want to share with you some things this morning, I, I, and, and if I'm not tying this together very well, just let me know. I want to share an experience by Kenneth E. Hagan. That happened back in probably the 30s. Kenneth E. Hagan was, um, he was the president of the Bible college that I went to, but he had an interesting relationship with the Lord. And he stood in the office in the end time of his ministry, in the office of the prophet. And he had many times where the Lord would appear to him and talk to him. And so I want to read an excerpt from his book, I Believe in Visions. As the Lord continued to deal with my life, he appeared to me in a vision on, on, form on several occasions. And to understand the scriptural background for visions, uh, let's go back into the day of Pentecost. And following the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter boldly preached a sermon to those who had gathered to see the marvel of the 120 speaking in other tongues. 
Now, a portion of Peter's message to the crowd is found in the second chapter of books, the second chapter of Acts, um, 2, 14 through 21. And, you know, Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judah and all of you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing but it's the third hour of the day, but it is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I think that's an important, important factor because the prophets speak. The prophets foretell of dispensations that are coming, some of warning, some of perseverance, perseverance some to help us to make changes necessary. And Israel was known by having many prophets, but it was also known to not regard the words that were spoken by the prophets. The Bible calls them stiff-necked people. They, were, they, they killed their prophets because they didn't like they, what the prophets were at that time. The Spirit of God is not like it is in our dispensation. The Spirit of God would only come upon the prophet, the priest, and the king. You and I, are we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. That didn't happen. And so God would speak through the prophets. The anointing would come upon the prophets, and they would prophesy, and they would speak. Israel had a choice then to adhere to what the prophets were saying and to be obedient to the word of the Lord, or to be disobedient. And many times they didn't hearken under the word of the Lord. So there were consequences. There was judgment for the disobedience. And verse 16, But this which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above, signs in the earth, beneath blood, fire, vapor, and smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before this great and notable day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As the astonished crowd heard the believers speaking in other tongues, they were all amazed, but yet were in doubt, saying no to one another. What does this mean? What does this mean? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. In other words, they've been drinking of that special sauce. We would say, tequila, arriba, right? But Peter boldly, notice this, boldly proclaimed. He stood up and declared, this is which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he went on to repeat Joel's prophecy. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So, in other words, Peter then explained this manifestation which the people were witnessing and had been foretold of by the prophets of God centuries before. Notice that centuries before, God proclaimed that that day in which they were now living, the day in which we are now living, was going to come to pass. When God speaks it, then we can declare it, watch for it, and step into it. There are things that are happening in this earth that have been prophesied generations ago that are just beginning to occur. And so... Peter then herald, heralded this new dispensation as a new day of God's grace and the beginning of the last days, which is, which is what Joel referred to. And today we're living in these last days. How long are the last days going to continue? Until the last day. But they began when Jesus ascended into heaven. We call it the church age. It's the last days. And so... A young man's vision and the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy and the outpouring of the Spirit was that young men shall see visions. 
The Amplified Bible says that your young men shall see visions. That's the divinely granted appearances. Think about it. John Michael had a divine... Now, yes, he stepped out of his body. That wasn't a vision. That was him. But the next day, he had a divine appearance. Jesus appeared to him. The angels of God. He saw them sta standing in his room. Two big white beings. That's a vision. Your young men shall see visions, divinely a grant, granted appearances. You know, I, I'll be honest with you. Now, John Michael, yes, he's unique and he's special because of his disability, but that boy has, he's been to heaven, I mean, on several occasions. So when people say heaven's not real, he says, oh no, I've been there. He's talked with Jesus. I remember when my mother was transitioning over. She took comfort in what heaven was like because John Michael had been there and had already explained it to her. Now, he doesn't remember because he was a, a lot younger than he is now, but we have it written down. He was talking about things in the Bible that he had no, never even talked to him about, no knowledge of it. He was quoting not verbatim revelations, but he was describing the things that were in heaven that are in the book of Revelations. We can't discount when people make these assertions, especially our young people. I've never seen Jesus face to face. I know people who have. Now, I have seen Jesus. I've stood right next to him. I know it was him. I've seen his robe. Hallelujah. Divinely granted appearances. My kids have seen angels. We have to be very careful when our children say these things not to hamper them from the experience in which God allowed them to have. Again, I'll make this declaration. Angelic visitations are increasing. There's angels all in this room. You just can't see them. That doesn't mean they're not here. There's an angel with you wherever you go. The Bible says he will give his angels charge over you so you won't even stumble upon a rock. You won't even stub your toe, another translation says. Hallelujah. And so, Hagen goes on to say that he want, that he's going... He was given a divinely granted appearance when he was 33 years old. And at the time of his experience, he was conducting a tent revival in Rockwell, Texas during the latter part of August and the first part of September of 1950. On Saturday, September the 2nd, it rained all day. Not a hard driving rain, but a slow, gentle, soaking rain like what we have today. It was still raining that evening at church time. And when we arrived at the tent, there were only about 40 people present. Hallelujah. Rockwall is in the black lands of north central Texas. And there is a saying that if you stick with the black land when it is dry, it will stick with you when it's wet. <laughs> and many people have been attending the meetings, lived in the country. and They couldn't get out to the service at night because of the rain and the mud. And that's why the crowd was so small, he said, because everyone present was a Christian. He said, I gave a Bible lesson and then invited people to come to the front to pray. It was about 9.30. And let me say that I no more expected what was to follow than I expected to be the first man to land on the moon. I hadn't been doing any unusual praying or fasting. I hadn't been praying that I would have such an experience. In fact, I hadn't even thought about such a thing. Everyone was praying around the front, and I knelt on the platform beside the folding chair near the pulpit, and I began to pray in other tongues. And I heard this voice say to me, Come up hither. At first, I didn't realize that the voice was speaking to me. I thought everybody heard it. Come up hither, the voice said again. Then I looked and saw Jesus standing where the top of the tent would be. As I looked up again, the tent had disappeared. And the folding chairs uh, had disappeared. And every tent pole had disappeared. The pulpit had disappeared. God permitted me to see into the realm of the Spirit. 
And Jesus was standing there, and I, as I stood in his presence, he was holding a crown in his hands. This crown was so extraordinarily beautiful that human language cannot even begin to describe it. Jesus told me, this is a soul winner's crown. Many people today are so careless and indifferent. But this crown is for every one of my children. I speak and I say, go speak to this one or pray for that one. But my people are too busy. They put it off and souls are lost because they will not obey me. I wonder what would have happened if people this past week hadn't been obedient to pray for our family. The importance of prayer when God brings these things to you is life and death. And yet we're so indifferent because we're so busy. They put it off and souls are lost because they will not obey me. And when Jesus said that, he said, I wept before him. I knelt down and repented of all my fa failures. Then Jesus said to me again, come up hither. And it seemed as if I went with him through the air until we came to a beautiful city. Now, we did not actually go into the city, but we beheld it at a close range as one might go up on a mountain and look down on a city in the valley. It was beauty beyond words. And Jesus said that people selfishly say that they're ready for heaven. They talk about their mansions and the glories of heaven while the many of around them live in the darkness and hopelessness. And Jesus said, I should share my hope with them and invite them to come to heaven with me. And then Jesus turned to me and said, now let's go down to hell. And we came back down out of heaven and we went to, when we went to earth, we didn't stop, but we kept right on going. Now numerous scriptures in the Bible refer to hell as being beneath the earth. For example, in Isaiah 14, it says, Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet me at the coming, and thou shalt be brought down to hell. Isaiah 5, 14 says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and, and he shall descend into it. So we went down to hell, and as we went into that place, I saw what appeared to be human beings wrapped in flames. I said, Lord, this looks like it did when I died and came to this place in April 22 of 1933. You spoke and I came back up out of here and then I repented and prayed and seeking your forgiveness. You saved me. Only now I feel so different. I'm, ne I'm, neither, I'm not either af neither afraid nor horrified as I was then. And Jesus told me, warn men and women about this place. Now, I'm telling you the church is failing on that particular subject. Warn them about hell warn them about the circumstances of living without the master in their life. We want to make all of our sermons happy, peppy, you know, just make everybody feel good. But there has to be an element of separation and holiness as well. We have to come back to the place where we warn people that there is an eternal destination that is separated from God for lack of, of a decision to accept Jesus. But then we also have to be obedient to the master when he says, go to this one or to that one, or to pray for this one or to that one, to stand in the gap as Abraham did and intercede for the judgment that is to befall them should they not change their ways. Hell is eternal judgment for never accepting the, the, the gracious gift of Jesus Christ. Hell is as real a place as, as heaven. Hell is as real a place as what we're sitting here today. Just because we can't see it. Just because right now I can't see my property in Pipe Creek doesn't mean that I don't own it, that I don't have it, that it's not real. Just because you may be sitting in this room and you can't, you're not, you can't see your house doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Hell is just as real as heaven. Man was never designed, destined, or determined to go to hell. However, spiritual death is real. What is spiritual death? Is separation from de death is just separation, ceasing from life. So spiritual death is a cessation, cessation from life. Who is the author of life? God. And the interesting part about it is, as we go back to Sodom and Gomorrah, what, was there, what, was, what did Jesus say about them? Their sin was so flagrant 
It was so out there. They didn't even bother to hide. In fact, they were proud of it. You cannot be proud of sin. Sin is disobedience to the laws and promises of God. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Thank God, though, that we have an advocate with the Father. Amen? His name is Jesus Christ. He paid the price for our sin. That's why when people say when they're born again, I'm just a plain old sinner. No, you're not. You may sin, but Jesus took that sin from you already. You're not a sinner. Oh, I'm just an unworthy old sinner saved by grace. Yeah, you were saved by grace, all right. But you're not a sinner no more. You are a blood-bought, blood-washed, blood-redeemed child of the living God who walks in authority and victory. You may sin from time to time, but you have an advocate with the Father in 1 John 1, 9 that if anyone who sins confesses their sin, he's faithful and just to forgive them. You wash white as snow. You clean. You may have some habits in your life right now that, that, that you're working on getting out of or that may be part of your old nature that you haven't quite got victory, but thanks be unto God, He gives us the victory that we walk above and not beneath because we're the head and not the tail. Amen. You can be an overcomer because you are an overcomer through the blood of the Lamb. Some things, you know, are so ingrained in us, not only through society, but because we've lived in that lifestyle for so long that when Jesus comes into our life, we're expecting these baby believers just to all of a sudden just be cleaned up, washed up, and never messed up. And I, I don't know about you, but when my babies were babies, they still pooed on themselves. And they still made messes. And I still cleaned them up. And the same is true that we have to get away from judging these baby believers that are just young in the Lord. And I'm not talking about age because uh, as, if we're not developing and growing in the master, we're going to stay young for a long time and we're going to be making messes for people. And so instead of... Instead of making demands on them and, and you know... I don't know about you, but I didn't go to my, my six-month-old and I said, all right, sit up at the table and eat. Here's your fork. Here's your spoon. Why? Because they were unable to. I was still bottle feeding, formula, yucky green pea stuff. You don't know anything about that, do you, Tom? They were unable to. So let's quit forcing these young believers to be something they cannot be until they develop and grow and mature in the things of God. And then let the Word of God, which richly dwells on the inside of them, develop them and grow them from the inside out as we nurture them and love them and help them and are an example to them. Hallelujah. There are people out there that are looking for what you have but are afraid to take the step because they don't want to be judged for their imperfections. Who does? And we can graciously lead people away from sin into the light without beating them up whipping them, condemning them. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn you. The Holy Spirit comes to convict, but not to condemn. There's a difference. You know when you've done wrong, because the Holy Spirit convicts you. This ain't right. But uh, let me say something else to you this morning, because if you continue to keep the same repetitive lifestyle that the Holy Spirit has convicted you about, which is sin according to God's Word, eventually what's going to happen is you'll become deadened internally to the right and wrong. Instead of being a righteousness consciousness, that that's not right, we will say, well, you know, feels good, do it. You do it long enough, 
your sin stick, uh, that's not a good thing, but the Holy Spirit, that conviction, I know when I've done wrong, but I also know that there are some things that I enjoy doing. Now don't look at me in that tone of voice. You know, it feels good to do it, it's the old saying. Flip Wilson, you said, devil made me do it. Devil didn't make you do it, it's your flesh. Hallelujah. And you know what's right and what's wrong. But if you don't adhere to the Holy Spirit's direction, and I'm talking to myself this morning, just as much as I'm talking to you, then you're going to get into disobedience and you're going to get out of the perfect will of God and into the permissive will. And that's a dangerous place to be because now you're in the arena where Satan can come in and you're out from under the shadow of the Almighty. And so we go back to Brother Hagin. Is this helping you this morning? Yeah. Am I bring it, tying it all in? And so then he said, he stood there, Jesus stood there and he talked to me about my ministry. And he told me some things in general that he later explained in more detail in another vision. Then Jesus appeared and I real, then, then Jesus disappeared and I realized I was still kneeling on the platform. And I could hear people crying all around me. The angelic messenger about that time, the Holy Spirit came, oh, the angelic messenger, about that time the Holy Spirit came upon me again. And it seemed as if a wind were blowing on me, and I fell flat on my face on the platform. As I lay under the power of God, it seemed as if I were standing high on a plane somewhere in, a sp in, in space. And I could see for miles and, and miles around me, and just as one can stand on the great plains of the United States and gaze off to the distance for miles. And I looked in every direction, but I couldn't see a sign of life anywhere. There were no trees or grass, no flowers or vegetation of any kind. There were no birds or animals. I felt so lonely, he said. I was not conscious of my earthly surroundings. As I looked at the, towards the, to the west, I saw what appeared to be a tiny dot on the horizon. It was the only moving thing I could see. And as I watched, it grew larger and it came toward me, taking on the shape and form. So I could see it was a horse and it came closer, I could see a man upon the horse. And he was riding toward me at full speed. And as he approached, I could see he held the reins of the horse's bridle in his right hand. And in his left hand, high above his head, he held a scroll of paper. And when the horseman came to me, he pulled, out, he pulled on the reins and stopped. And I stood on his right. He passed the scroll from his left hand to his right hand and handed it to me. Isn't that amazing, the detail that can be provided after the fact, after you have an experience like this. Same with John Michael. Man, he was, he was explaining in detail almost a week after it happened, like it happened yesterday. So as I unrolled the scroll, which was a roll of paper 12 to 14 inches long, he said, take and read. At the top of the page in big black bold print were the words, war and destruction. He said, I was struck dumb. He laid his hand on my head and said, read in the name of Jesus Christ. And I began to read what was written on the paper. And as the words instructed me, I looked and saw what I had just read about. First, I read about thousands upon thousands of men in uniform. Then I looked and saw these men marching wave after wave of soldiers marching as to war. I looked in the direction they were going. And as far as I could see, could see there were thousands of men marching. I turned to read the scroll again and then looked and saw what I had just read about. I saw many women, old and with snowy white hair, middle-aged women, young, men, young women and teenagers. Some of the younger ones held babies in their arms and the women were bowed together in sorrow and were weeping profusely. And those who did not carry babies held their hands on their stomachs as they bowed over and wept, bowed over and wept. Tears flowed from their eyes like water. I looked at the scroll again and again. I looked to see what I had read about. I saw the skyline of, large, of a large city. Looking closer, I saw the skyscrapers were all burned out halls. Portions of the city lay in ruins. It was not written that just one city would be destroyed, burned, and in ruins, but that there would be many such cities. And the scroll was written in the first person and seemed as if Jesus himself were speaking. I read, America is receiving her last call. Some nations already have received their last call and will never will receive another. Then in the larger print it read, it said, the time of the end of all things is at hand. Now this is back in 1930. 1933, I believe. The statement was repeated four or five times. Jesus also said this was the, great, was the last great revival. He went on to say, 
All the gifts of the Spirit will be in operations in the church in these last days, and the church will do greater things than even the early church did. It will have greater power, signs, wonders, than were recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. He said, we have seen and experienced many healings, but we will now behold amazing miracles that have not been seen before. And Jesus continued and said, more and more miracles will be performed in the last days, which are just ahead. For it is a time of the gift of the working of miracles to be more in prominence. Now, we have entered into an era of the miraculous. Now, he's writing this many years later. Many of my own people will not accept the moving of, the, of my spirit. Notice that. Many of my own, this is Jesus talking. Many of my own people will not accept the moving of my spirit and will turn back and will not be ready to meet me at my coming. Many will be deceived by false prophets and miracles of satanic origin. But follow the word of God, the spirit of God in me, and you will not be deceived. Notice that sentence. Follow the word of God, the spirit of God, and Jesus, and you will not be deceived. For I am gathering my own together and preparing them for the time is short. The time was short then. How much shorter is it now? And there were, other, there were several other exhortations to watchfulness, to awaken and to pray, and to not be deceived. To awaken and pray and not be deceived. Then he, I read, as it was in the days of Noah, shall, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now Noah was another one that stood and prophesied. Almost a hundred years that there was judgment coming. The prophets have been speaking to the nations for quite some time now. He says, I spoke to Noah. Jesus says, I spoke to Noah and said, for yet seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth. Forty days and forty nights and every living substance that I have made will, will I destroy from the face of the earth. You can find reference to that in Genesis chapter 7 verse 4. So today I am speaking and giving America her last warning and calling it to and a call to repentance. And the time that is left is comparable to the last seven days of Noah's time. Judgment is coming. Warn this generation as did Noah his generation for judgment is about to fall. Where's the churches? We're making everybody feel happy. And rightfully so. We need good, uplifting, encouraging messages. But we also need to speak what God has been saying. The time is short. Judgment is coming. Sin is at an all-time perverseness. And these sayings shall be fulfilled shortly, for I'm coming soon, Jesus said. This is the last revival. I'm preparing my people for my coming. Judgment is coming, but I will call my people away, even unto myself, before the worst shall come. Be faithful, watch and pray, for the time of the end of all things is at hand. At the time I had this vision, naturally I interpreted the scenes to mean that America would experience the devastation of war. However, when I saw the, saw the television, newspaper photographs of destruction wrought by the student rebellion and the race riots in the 1960s, I realized that these scenes partially fulfilled this vision. This is why it is so important not to place your own interpretation on the things God shows you. Those who were present that night under the tent said I read the scroll aloud for about 30 minutes. He said, however, I, can't not, I cannot remember all of it. Then I handed the scroll back to the writer, and he rode away in the direction from which he came. Then I was conscious of the fact that I still lay flat on my face on the floor. In a few minutes, I remained there feeling the glory of his miraculous visitation. Again, I heard the voice say, come up hither to the throne of, of God. The throne of God, again, I saw Jesus standing about where the top of the tent should be, and I went to him through the air, and when I reached him together, we continued to heaven. We came to the throne of God, and I beheld it in all its splendor. I was not able to look upon the face of God, I only beheld his form. The first thing that attracted my attention was the rainbow about the throne. It was very beautiful. The second thing I noticed was the winged creatures on the side of the throne. They were peculiar looking creatures, and as I walked up with Jesus, these creatures stood with wings outstretched, and they were saying something, but they ceased and folded their wings. They had eyes of fire all around their heads, and they looked in all directions at once. I stood with Jesus in the midst, about 18 to 24 feet from the throne. I looked at the rainbow first. 
at the winged creatures, and then I started to look at the one who sat upon the throne, and Jesus told me not to look upon his face. I could only see a form of being seated upon the throne. Jesus talked with me for nearly an hour. People say, they, they would ask Brother Hagin, what did his eyes look like? And all he can say is they looked like wells of living love. He said while he was in heaven, Jesus talked to him concerning about things about his ministry. He went on to say that he, that he had been called before he was born. Called before he was born. I think that's interesting. He said although that Satan had tried to destroy his life many times, his angels had watched over him and cared for him. Jesus told me that even as he had appeared to my mother before I was born and told her, fear not, the child will be born, I would minister in the power of the Spirit and will fulfill the ministry he had called me to. Then he talked to me about the last church I had pastored. But the last church I pastored, saying that at that time, which was February 1949, he had entered in the first phase of his ministry, been pastoring for, been in ministry for 12 years. He said, Jesus said that some ministers he has called to the ministry live and die without getting into the first, into the first phase that he has for them. That could be said for the rest of us as well. Jesus added that one reason why men and ministers die prematurely, they are living only in his permissive will. So he said, he talked about the time that I entered into my first phase of my ministry in 1949. He said, I had been unfaithful, hadn't done what he told me to do. I hadn't told the people what he had told me to tell them. Notice that? He said, I had been unfaithful to do what God had told me to do. I answered, Lord, I wasn't unfaithful. I did obey you. I left my church and went out in the evangelistic field. Yes, he said, you left the church and went out in the evangelistic work, but you didn't do what I told you to do. The reason you didn't is because you doubted it was my spirit who had spoken to you. Notice that statement. You doubted it was my spirit that had spoken to you. You see, faith obeys my word, whether it is written, whether it is the written word of God, or my spirit who has spoken unto man. I tell you what, man, that caught me, because God's spoken some things to me, and I always, ah, no, I don't, that's not me, that's not me. God's speaking to hearts. When he speaks these things to you, we have a responsibility not to put it on the shelf and walk away from it, but, but, the, but begin to declare it. Yeah, I'll do that, Lord. God speaking, uh, God spoke something to me this past week, man. It, it shook me. It shook me because, um, to be honest with you, it, 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 it takes me not only out of my comfort zone, but it alarms me. And I have to make a choice. He didn't show me, he showed me kind of what it was, but he didn't show me where it was and all these things. And so your brain kicks in. You know what I mean? Oh, my goodness. What about this? What about that? How are we going to do this? That's not my worry. And so I have to roll those thoughts off under the Lord. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? That's not my worry. My, what I have to do is exactly what Mary did when Gabriel showed up and said, hey, you're going to be pregnant and you ain't going to be by no man. And what did she say? Be it done unto me according to thy will. And so when, when God comes and shows you things or requests things of you, instead of, instead of going, what Brother Hagin, he didn't want to do it because he was unsure that it was the Spirit of God. How do we get sure? We say, be it done unto me according to your will. And then we have to put our mind to rest on all the how-tos. Because in 19, I'll give you an example. Back about the turn of the century, Pastor Kim and I, we were living in Pipe Creek. 
on our property and we began to feel a change, a shift. And that shift dealt with location change. Now, if you're not careful, you can get, well, I'll tell you what we did is we began to, all right, we began to seek where maybe the Lord might be sending us. So we went out to California, we went to Florida, we went to Corpus Christi, we went all these places only to find out those weren't the right places. And in the end, after seeking the Lord for quite some time, he said, well, San Antonio is your home. Well, when he told me San Antonio was my home, did you see, then I got the confirmation that this is where we needed to be, then I could move in a direction. And all that wondering and all that spending of the money to... And so what I learned out of that, when God speaks things to you, you don't have to go and do all this stuff to figure it out. God will show you. You continue to stay in prayer, and you continue to, to just seek God, and He will lead you. But the thing is that you have to be obedient to follow. If He says stop, you stop and say, your flesh goes, no, I, I like that. I want, I want that. He said stop, you have to stop. He says, go, and you say, I don't want to go. I like it over here. Then you get, out of the, you get it out of the perfect will into the permissive will. You getting anything out of this morning? And so we, we, have, to, we have to follow the Spirit of God by that inward leading. And some of the things, some of the things that He may require you to do may not be, you know, real per se big in your mind, but they're big in God's mind. Because lives are hanging in the balance. There may be things that you are sitting out to do. You're, you're fixing to make a decision that's wrong. And the Spirit of God is dealing with you about that. The flesh says, yes, that's what I want to do. That's where I want to go. That's how I want to be. But the Spirit of God says, no, there's a danger. And you're going, but, but, but. Some of the buts I never understood. I mean, I was, I was mad at God for not letting me move to Corpus Christi where I wanted to, to live, by the beach. But I look back. I look back, man. I look back. Our first house that we were looking at, Pastor Kim. Now, here, Pastor Kim and I, when we were living out, we knew we were going to be moving into Saturday. So we began to, we began to do research. We began to look at homes and... Man, we found a house in the Alamo Ranch area. Uh, it was built by um, another builder. And so we looked at that. And, oh, wow, that's a nice house. And just on the inside, no. And I didn't understand it. Didn't understand it. But I didn't. We, we could have bought the house. It was a nice corner lot. But, you know, we looked at several houses and I kept going, we kept going back because I wanted to buy that house. Now I look at that house today, and I look at the house that God gave us. Well, here's, so while we're doing that, now he, he doesn't let us buy that house. Yeah. Have you ever had times when God, you just felt God hasn't let you do something, you're just grumpy at him? <laughs> All right, so don't, you know, and say, how <laughs> you? So, then we find this other subdivision, and we really like the subdivision because we're kind of like the first people in that subdivision. And so, man, we contracted to build this house, nice house. Oh, man, nicest house. It was the biggest house at that time they were building in the subdivision. It was like 1,800 square feet or something, you know. Hooey. Well, when you live in a 1,300 square foot house on wheels, <laughs> permanent foundation is good. And so we got that thing up and built and we had to sell the house out in Pipe Creek to be able to buy that house according to their financing people. So we got it all the way to drywall and if it wasn't built, if, it, if we hadn't sold our house by the time drywall, then the contract was null and void. So we, we had somebody and they backed out right at drywall time. It's like, oh man, I got so angry at God. You let us hear. You, 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 you. I was angry at him for a month. I mean, him and I had some serious kind of. Finally, I just repented. I said, You know better than I do. So that was in June. July come. Nobody bought the house. 
August 1st, Kim said, well, we're buying, I like her decision, Pastor Kim said, I'm, I'm going to go buy a house today. I have my checkbook in hand. I'm going to go buy a house and we're going to pit people against each other. And who has the best price? And so I wanted the house we built. It was the house I built. And there was a house across the street that was just, we ended up with. It was $30,000 cheaper, had more space in it. And so now that I look back, that first house that I really wanted was smaller than the house we ended up living. God had a better plan. And so when God began to deal with us about selling that house, Kim told, Pastor Kim came to me the week before. She said, what do you think about this house? Is this your forever home? Oh, yeah, yeah. I ain't moving nowhere. This is almost paid for. We almost got this thing done. And look, we got an interest rate at like 2.5. Eh? It's 2.8. No way. I went to a counseling session, and God spoke to the counselor, through the counselor to me and on a Friday. That Friday, I was looking at houses. We were moving. Saturday, Sunday, we contracted on the lot in the house that we were at today and had it built. See, when God wants to enlarge your tent, He's not going to tell you. He's going to, you're thinking, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. I, I had to get my head around that house because it was the biggest thing I'd ever, I, I mean, I can't live, what are my friends going to think? They come in, Ooh, look at you, you living in a mansion. I ain't got a bill yet, but mansion's 5,000 square feet or more. i just a, sh a little bit shy of that. But yet that house has served us, not only us, but it served this house. See, God has plans. Will you step out and will you be obedient? Will you step out and will you be obedient? Because God's wanting to enlarge your tents. And so when God begins to, to, to muckle in your muckle, muck boots, that's what I bought, muck boots, muckle in your muckle, he's not muckling in your muckle to muckle you. He's muckling to, to prepare you for harvest. When we closed His Grace Church 1, we had an opportunity. I had two opportunities that were presented to me. One was to, when, when at that time, Pastor Kim and I were just visiting Pastor Odell's Life Family Church, and every time I went there, it seemed like, wow, this is home. Don't know why, but like a good, faithful minister, I ran from that and went somewhere else for two and a half years, completely out of the will of God. Where'd I end up? Right back there, two and a half years later. Sometimes you don't know why God places you in a place, but you just have to say, be it done unto me according to your will. Amen? Amen. A lot of information. Went across a lot of avenues this morning. But when God speaks to you to pray, when God leads you to pray, be faithful. You know, you don't have to be in your prayer closet, huckle down like a warrior. A lot of times I'm praying driving. I'm praying at work. I'm praying throughout the day. I don't have time to go find me a hole in my closet and, and dedicate an hour. Now, there are times where I think it's important, so don't misinterpret me. But my life does not allow that, so I've had to learn to pray on the go. Speak the Word. Declare the Word. Follow the Spirit of God. Amen. Step out when He tells you to step out. There are reasons behind what God's requiring of you. Every move we make that Pastor Kim and I have made has uh, just undermined and assured us of the faithfulness of God, but it's never been easy to make that original step because your mind gets in there. It wants to muckle the muck. What a great title for a sermon, muckle the muck. It wants to mess with you. It wants to, it don't like to be uncomfortable, but sometimes the plan and the will of God will make you uncomfortable until you find out that it's so much better I remember a story of an individual that they were believing God to sell the house and they, had, they were flipping houses and, and then they would 
as, as, the, as they got it done, they would move into that house until it was sold and they would move out. And, and so they used the prayer of agreement. And the prayer, they had sold several houses throughout their, their, their career and it had just been very quick. And so this last house, it went unsold for over a year. And this individual, you know, the husband and wife were together with this minister and they said, the husband said, I don't, I don't understand why we agreed, and the Bible says if you touch anything on earth and agree, and it will be done, why this house hasn't sold. And the wife finally admitted, admitted to, the, to the husband and to the pastor, he said, well, it's me, honey. It's me. I'm not in total agreement. She says, well, why? He says, because this is the best house we've ever, we've ever lived in. This is the nicest neighborhood we've ever been a part of. And I, I, I just couldn't give it up. But she says, you know, I'm going to agree with you. And that house sold within a week. The next house was even nicer. See, sometimes we hold on to what we have when God's calling us to let it go so that he can move us to the next place. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to do great and mighty things in this place. Well, I agree. I saw this place by the Spirit of God this morning full. I mean, I didn't see it as I'm looking at the chairs, empty chairs. I saw full chairs. I'm going to do great and mighty things. His Grace Church, where miracles still happen today, is a place of divine visitation. And we have to prepare our hearts to receive that. It just doesn't happen, folks. Nothing can be, nothing can be accomplished in the earth except through prayer. We're crying out for something. We're crying out to our God for the, to the lives of people. There are people's lives that are hanging in the balance, that are waiting for us to, to come across their life. I can't be everywhere to every person, but every one of you is a representation of God in this house. More people have come to this house because people have been invited. Amen? So... Hallelujah. The Spirit of God is moving and drawing. The Spirit of God is developing and growing people. Hallelujah. God has a plan. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. And those plans are not cemented in concrete. They're, they're moving and they're developing and they're uh, um, continuing to kind of be formed and fashioned in the image of God. I like that. They're evolving. Yeah. So don't be, don't be like, I did what you told me to do, so I'm, I'm here, and that's it. Hallelujah. Nanu, nanu. <laughs> Evolve with God. Grow with God. Learn to hear God. Be obedient to the Spirit of God. Your life may depend on it someday. Your financial success may depend on hearing the voice of God. Don't don't put your money in that resource. Put it over here. Oh, but they're telling me if I put it over here. We had a financial advisor one time. Wasn't even in the business. He said, uh, if, you'll, if, if you'll structure this this way, you'll find that it will work for you well. Well, that's not what this fund, who were our slush fund was. But, you know, we followed that advice. And over years, that thing has paid, it, it has done very well. See? What would happen? We say, eh. Hey. But then they've also given us advice. <laughs> and it didn't come to pass. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you've got you to follow the Spirit of God. Right. If you'll follow the Spirit. And you know, there's nothing wrong with stepping out and trying and failing. Failure is not mean that, oh, it's done, it's over with. It means, okay, I get up and go at it again. You know, I get up and go at it again. And so step out. Step out into the glory. Step out into the power. Step out into that place God's called you to walk in this hour. And you'll see the, manifested, uh, the manifestations of the Holy Ghost as required and necessary for you to do the job that is immediately in front of you. He'll empower you. Hallelujah. You're not doing this on your own. 
That's why it's important to hear the Spirit of God. You're not doing this on your own. He's leading you. He's guiding you. He's directing you. And some of you need direction right now. Because if you're not listening, you're going to get into trouble. Ouch. I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. Hallelujah. Well, we better quit. What do you mean, yep? (laughs) Stepping on toes. (laughs) You know you're in trouble when the associate passes. Yeah, it's time to quit. I can't take any more of this. Stepping out and stepping into the glory. Stepping out and stepping into the glory. For some of you, um, he's told you what to do. You've heeded and heard, but you've been, deb- been, been disobedient. You haven't accomplished the task that's what's been set before you. What is the solution? Repent. Repent and begin anew. The plan for you hasn't changed. The plan hasn't been altered. What has been altered is your thought process. So just stand up, step out, step in, and begin. Begin to move out. Begin to declare. Begin to put that promise of God into the air. Then be faithful to do what God has told you to do in the ability that has been granted in this particular time frame. You don't need tomorrow's peace. You need to complete today's peace. For it cannot be built with missing parts. The foundation has to be laid and has to be solid for it to hold the weight of the glory. So stand up. And don't be lazy. Mm. Don't be lazy. And don't look at me in that tone of voice, because I'm just, I'm just like you. Don't be lazy in what I've told you to do. Make it prominent and important. Put importance to the word, importance to your prayer time. Importance and diligence will bring a greater glory and a degree of anointing that you have not walked in as of yet. For I have a place for you to step into. I have a place for you to walk, saith the Lord. But you have caused that place not to operate in its full dynamic dimension. It's not that I don't want to bless you. It's not that I don't want you to walk in the place that I've called you to walk. But you have been unfaithful in the call. You have been unfaithful in these areas. So stand up and say, I'll go, I'll do, I'll be everything you've called me to. I'll come spend time with you, Lord. I'll hear your voice. I'll follow the leading of the Spirit. I'll retrain myself to be diligent servant in the army of my God. For you have a plan for me. You have a purpose for my life. Greater degrees of anointing. Greater degrees of abilities. Greater degrees of the miraculous to operate. If you'll only separate. If you'll only separate unto me, saith the Lord. Separate yourself. Unto the place I have called you to walk. And you will walk above and not beneath. You will be the head and not the tail. You will be the top and not the bottom. For the dispensation of the hour is calling for the Holy Ghost power. So you must prepare. You must separate. You must be ready for the Master's use. For at any given time you may be called upon. And your inabilities and your incapabilities will prevent you from walking in the fullness of time, in the power of God. 
So rise up, stand up, and take your place. Rise up, stand up, and take your place and train the generations. Train the generations. Train the generations. Train. Lead. Guide. Direct. Love. And impart the wisdom and truth necessary to be successes. And I will lead you to the people group, and I will lead you to the people group, and I will lead you to this people group, and I will lead you to that people group, and you'll see the hand of the Lord outstretched upon your life. And many will come to know, and many will come to see my glory because of not your ability, but my ability, your ability in me, saith the Lord. So step up, stand up, step up, and step out. And to declare what I have spoken over you. Believe it. Receive it. Declare it. Say, well, that, that, that's not me. I don't know if I can do that. It'll, it will become you. And associated with you. Because it's of me, saith the Lord. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 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 Well, glory to God. How do you end a service such as this? Hallelujah. You know, you may be watching, and this may be a little different service, but these are the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, different manifestation of the Holy Ghost. But, you know, the most important gift that... that Jesus gave is, or God gave us his son, Jesus Christ. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, ha ha, then, then I want to give you that opportunity right now. Hallelujah. I keep hearing this word, keep hearing this word, correction in the house. Correction in the house. Take heed to the correction that has been given today. Take heed to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the instruction. Take heed to step out, to rise up. Take heed. Hallelujah. You know, too often we hear, and then that's all we do is we hear things the Spirit of God is saying to us today is to take heed. The realm of the Spirit is so real. The power of God is most awesome thing. It's a tool. Hallelujah. So if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity right now. As we read, that all who will come will be saved, no matter what your background is, no matter what you've done, it doesn't matter. Jesus has already accepted you. Today, if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, just pray this prayer with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you, to come into my heart and become Lord of my life. From this moment forward, I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want to welcome you to the kingdom of God. I invite you to go to our website where there's a plethora of training materials and our digital resources, but there's also a short video series called The New Birth. And within that video series, as Pastor Kim and I taught, it's about mm, 10 videos, five to seven minutes long, and it just helps you to understand what has occurred. I also encourage you to get into a good Bible-believing church. If you're in the San Antonio area, we believe His Grace Church is such a place as that. I want to remind you, Amplify, Thursday night, 7 to 8 p.m. And so we're going to continue teaching in our series on Back to the Basics on Health and Healing. So, you know, Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. I want to thank you all for staying hooked up with the Spirit of God this morning. 
Hallelujah. You're dismissed. Amen.